Hello, and thank you for viewing my presentation, where I'll be talking about how we've used sub-meta-analyses to maintain independence among spatially temporally replicated demographic data sets. My name is Alex Nicol Harper, and this is work done with Professor Patrick Doncaster and Professor Tom Ezard at the University of Southampton, and Dr Kevin Wood and Dr Jeff Hilton at the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. I'm going to kick off with some acknowledgements. So this work is part of my PhD, which is funded by a NERC Spitfire DTP award. The lovely photo in the background of the slides is taken by Kate Evans on behalf of the Wildfowl Wetlands Trust. And of course, a big thank you to my supervisory team. So a little bit of preamble. Uh, I'd like to point out at this point that our meta-analysis is slightly unusual in that we are meta-analyzing mean values rather than effect sizes. So this might be termed informal, an informal meta-analysis in the sense of Morrissey and colleagues 2016, in that we are reporting essentially the mean of a distribution of estimated values in a meta data set. However, we are using meta-analytical meta statistical methods, uh, so perhaps it would be a formal meta-analysis in that sense. The method that we use is an established method of Doncaster and Spake, and it is inverse variance weighting with adjustment for small samples. And this, the benefit of this method is it is accounting for those small sample sizes um, and it also allows you to use studies which haven't necessarily provided an estimate of variance. So I'll quickly run through what this method uh, entails. So for the random effects error structure, which is what we're using, you're calculating your meta estimate as the sum of the products of weightings and estimates divided by the sum of the weightings. For study level means weighted by one over bi plus t squared, where t squared is Cochrane's estimator of between study variance and the study level error variances vi are calculated by the mean variance across all the studies divided by each sample size. So just to reiterate that, taking the mean of the variances is the adjustment for small sample sizes, but what it allows us to do is to include studies which haven't got an associated variance. And the metavariance is then one divided by the weight, some of the weightings. So meta-analysis is a useful tool in demography, uh, so study of populations and what makes them up. Uh, for example, this study of the spotted owl by Boyce and colleagues they state that meta-analysis can be used to combine results from multiple demographic studies replicated in time and space to obtain estimates of vital rates. In this case, the vital rates they're interested in are juvenile survival, adult survival, and fertility. In this example with the black bear by Beston, the meta-analysis considers vital rates for the black bear across North America. Uh, this plot shows the mean cub survival, but one of their findings was that overall survival and fertility values differed between Eastern and Western North America, with an apparent trade-off across these two main sets of vital rates. While this meant that they couldn't really use overall averages for the whole of North America, generalising across the continent, the process census did uncover avenues for further research and tailored management. But demographic data sets tend to be messier than those that are typically subjected to meta-analysis in other fields. This for two reasons. Firstly, because ecological data sets in general tend to encompass a lot of natural variation and the presence of covariates with a large range of scale of replication. And demographic data sets in particular tend to include lots of observational data, so people going out and uh, you know, counting the number of eggs or other types of offspring, for example, rather than the sorts of experiments that might be used uh, to um, apply meta-analyses in, say, medicine. Hence, demographic meta-analyses need careful application of accepted methodologies, for example, in relation to avoiding non-independence, as we're discussing here. So why are we looking at doing these sorts of meta-analyses? In my PhD, we use population modelling to investigate breeding ecology and inform conservation of the common ida, duck you can see here, uh, a well-studied sea duck of the northern hemisphere. And our theoretical models are designed to be relevant for the species as a whole, and hence we're wanting to parameterize them with some sort of global mean values. Uh, we have a data paper which describes our collation of vital rate estimates for this species. And we had over 20 independent estimates for adult annual survival, clutch size of the number of eggs laid per breeding attempt, and hatching success, which is the proportion of eggs producing young. And with this sort of um, scale of data, we then wanted to meta-analyze each of these vital rates. However, our data sets 
for these vital rates contained many studies of internal replication and I'll sort of talk you through what that means. So much data collected by researchers they're in the field to gather um, data to answer a particular question. So for example, how does predator control affect adult survival? How does clutch size vary with age? Or how does hatching success, um, how is it affected by the presence of predators such as mink? And often they will have data collected across multiple years and or locations, so sites within their own study area. So for example, uh, Wood et al 2021 has adult survival studied across three colonies, as you can see here. There are studies which look at clutch size across different islands within a data set. So here we have Egg Island and Stump Island. And there are studies which uh, run over multiple years, in this case, hatching success from 1972 to 1974. Overall, there is this sort of internal replication. So different areas, different years, different types of islands, whether they're wooded or open. Uh, for 7% of adult survival studies that we found, 33% of clutch size studies and 12% of hatching success studies. And while these values are non-trivial, they also show that any attempts at some sort of full data analysis would be working with much reduced and effectively intractable data sets. So our question was how to make use of as much available information as possible while maintaining equivalence between inputs to the meta-analysis. So it's been stated that ideally a meta-analysis involves a single effect size estimate being derived for each study in order to maintain independence and to avoid pseudo-replication. In our case, this is um, a mean rather than an effect size, but the case stands. And where possible, we decided that we could apply our overarching meta-analysis methodology to each case as a sub-meta-analysis, ensuring that the overall meta-analysis is then conducted on independent replica observations per replica rate. And I'll point out at this stage, we're referring to the sub-meta-analysis, similarly to um, some mentions of meta-meta-analyses or supersyntheses rather than the sub-meta-analysis. Zugman et al. 2015. We believe that this aligns with the suggestions of Mengerson and colleagues. Uh, to avoid uh, losing potential data, you can adjust sample size, variance or weighting to represent true information content. And Hadaway and colleagues who state the meta analysis of the reduced data set is preferable to vote counting a larger data set. So, to show sort of more practically what we were considering. The example of Wood et al. with the adult survival of those different colonies presents three estimates of adult survival with associated standard errors and sample sizes. So what we would do is basically apply the overall methodology of our overall meta-analysis to this study. So we would first convert the standard errors to variances. We would then calculate a mean variance across those three estimates. We would calculate those VIs, so the mean variance that we just calculated divided by the sample size each estimate. We would calculate the t-squared, Cochrane's estimator. This is used to calculate weightings and from those we would calculate a meta-estimate and a meta-variance at this study level. So what we would then send forward to the main meta-analysis, the estimate is that meta-estimate we've just calculated and the variance is the meta-variance multiplied by the number of contributing estimates to allow compatibility with calculated variants for other studies that haven't undergone our sub-meta-analysis. So to illustrate the forest plot for adult survival, we have coded the cases where we've used the sub-meta-analysis with an asterisk, and I'll highlight them here. So with the Ecruz et al. 2012 case, uh, we've conducted a sub-meta-analysis across two replicates, and that gives um, um, a value of 0.72 as shown. It would actually be the same value if we're just taking simple mean across these two replicates, albeit less precise. And if we had made the decision, rather than doing some form of sub mean, to just send forward one of the estimates. So, for example, if we picked the most precise estimate, that with the smallest uh, standard error, that would give 0.761, which is quite significantly higher. Similarly, for Wood et al. 2021, across three replicates, the sub meta analysis gives 0.918. The mean would give 0.916, but if we picked either the most precise or the most the study with the largest sample size, this would give 0.94. So again, quite substantially larger. Hence, we hope that this sub-meta-analysis is balancing information content against risk bias. So again, with the Wood et al. case, the adult survivals are 0.887, 0.922, and 0.94 across those three sites. If we selected the estimate with the largest sample size, we would likely overestimate, as I showed in the previous slide. 
but we said all three estimates forward to a meta-analysis, this will then false equivalence to average estimates from other studies, which themselves likely represent some form of mean studies or years. Uh, whereas taking a mean, in this case, whether unweighted or weighted with our methodology, reduces the risk of bias and ensures fair comparison. So we hope the valuable information is retained while avoiding overweighting of potentially biased information. We think this methodology is similar to Senior et al's 2016 second order meta-analysis, uh, which I'll show on the next slide, the comparison, but it's theoretically closer to the solutions to non-independence offered by Nixon et al. So just to compare our uh, sub-meta-analysis to the second order meta-analysis of Senior et al, in that case, it's a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, uh, which is done in quite a few studies. Whereas in our case, we have three meta-analyses one per vital rate of 11 to 66 studies, of which some of those studies are providing a single estimate, which is itself a mean in all likelihood, um, and others provide multiple estimates on which we can conduct sub meta analysis. So each value going forward, the main meta-analysis represents a mean across years and sites. So to show the effect of these decisions, we've got a sensitivity analysis for adult survival. So if you just took our data set and did a mean with all the estimates of each of the sub estimates analyzed equivalently, you get a value of 0.56. If you take a simple mean, but you have done sub means across those studies that we've talked about, you get 0.857. If you do a weighted mean overall, so the meta analysis methodology, but sending forward simply the most precise single estimate from the relevant studies, the overall value is quite significantly higher at 0.861 whereas the weighted mean with either simple means or weighted means across the sub uh, studies gives 0.857. While these values might not seem particularly large, because this is um, adult survival, so it ranges from 0 to 1 potentially, um, but it's very influential on population dynamics of these sorts of species, and so small changes make a big difference. So it's important that we're getting close to some sort of global we did explore meta-regression, but we didn't find any obvious relationships. So I'll show you uh, an example. We did think that perhaps clutch size, which was our value for which we had the most data, might ge vary geographically, because there are um, subspecies of this species which are recognised. We did not find an obvious pattern for clutch size with latitude, but there was a hint that clutch size was smaller within the Arctic Circle. But we wondered whether that was because latitude is perhaps too simplistic. Very different climate regimes could be experienced by similar latitudes. For example, Ida's are found at approximately 57 degrees north in both Scotland and Hudson Bay, whereas the, the latter is much more extreme, freezing over in winter, for example. Sorry, that was my cat. So continentality and oceanity are indices for the cooling effect of land masses and the warming effect of oceans, respectively. Uh, and they were both found to be marginally stiffer predictors of clutch size. So on the left, you can see that mean clutch size is decreasing with increasing continentality, so that's harsher conditions, shorter breeding season, and the opposite for oceanity. There's some hint that perhaps the oceanity effect is uh, strongest for those above the 60 degrees north line and not really that um, important below, however the interaction was not significant. So this sort of thing can be useful extension, but for us, we had reason to focus on single estimates because we were trying to parameterize our population models for further analysis. So to summarize, submetro analysis address non-dependence within studies to provide us with a global mean vital rate. Where the interest is more in those underlying drivers, or where there's evidence of strong heterogeneity, such as between species, more so than uh, we found for this species, multi-level modeling would be the obvious method as recently developed by Nakagawa and colleagues. Uh, the associated code for that study implies it requires more balanced data than ours. So to reiterate, we had studies providing a single estimate across a single site year, single estimate, so some form of mean across multiple site year combinations, and multiple estimates across multiple site year combinations, which we uh, did our sub meta analyses on. And also some that had no sample sizes and were therefore excluded due to our method. Sample size but no variance, which can be handled by our method, and sample science and variance. So overall, um, like a really big mixture of data, uh, which we think is probably typical of demographic data sets and less so the other sorts of data sets which would tend to be meta-analyzed. Thank you very much for listening. Hope this has been useful.